Quack, 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 quack. Yeah. Quack, quack, quack. How you doing, boys? What have you done in this place? Well, Did... there isn't a tree here that was here when I came. It was absolutely bare, flat pasture land. We put in the ponds, this little river here, put in the hills. A lot of people think you and Morton Shulman are the two sort of classic armchair liberals or radicals. You're both, you're both very rich and you're still... They can think what they want. I don't really care. <laughs> Can you be can you be a rich and a radical and a reformer at the same well, time? Well, uh, the history is crammed with people who are wealthy and radicals and well-off and radicals. You see, when I began, I was quite poor and I was a radical. Uh, why should I be? Why should I change my political persuasion simply because I've done well? To me, that would be the height of hypocrisy. The invasion of Canada is, of course, a bestseller. One hundred and thirty thousand copies, with a fourth printing coming up. Now Burton can think about its sequel walking here in his very own forest. He trucked birch trees in from northern Ontario to make it as authentic as one of his history books. You won't believe this. This was um, all lawn about a year ago. Now it's a forest. And you know what's going to happen after I die? Some son of a bitch is going to come and clear it again. <laughs> I just love it. I come out here every day. It's nice to be able to walk through a, a little forest of your own. What are you going to do with all this loot? Are you going to blow it in your, in your old age? No, I've um, just written my will. I'm going to leave all of this that you see, and my house, and half of all of my money to uh, either the Writers Development Trust, which are now listed in the will, if they're still around, as a retreat for writers. I wrote, well, I've written 26 books here. I think it's a good place to work as a writer. You can get out and stretch your legs. There's a big house you can live mm -hmm. in with your wife or girlfriend and and the other half the other half to my kids there's a lot eight of them so it won't be too much for them i don't believe they should get too much so this is the house that the uh, that the business of writing no. built isn't it didn't look like that when we started there was no windows there was no doors not even a door in the bathroom i wrote my first four books in orange crates to pay for the uh, mortgage in this house which seemed like a lot to me then it wasn't uh, very much it was only eighty five hundred dollars but boy it was a huge sum in those days newspaper salaries in those That's days it was yeah, well, this is where I work, Eric. It's, um, as you can see, neat and tidy. Everything <laughs> carefully arranged. How much did you write today? I wrote 11 pages, which is about average of a rough copy. It's not clean copy. I have to rewrite that about oh, three or four times at least. Some sections get written 20 times. Before starting to write, Burton and his researchers spent two years putting all the documents, old letters, and references into thick binders. It's all cross-indexed with file cards, so we can flip up any subject or any character. Some of the historians, though, argue that maybe it's too easy, it's too slick. You have this filing system and you're cranking out here Woolworth's history. What do you think of that? I think one of the problems with uh, historians in Canada is there's no tradition of popular history. And nobody's telling you what it was really like. They're telling you what the great currents in history were. They don't tell you what the smell of things were like, or what people wore, or how they looked, or how they felt. I don't want to uh, sound egotistical here. I don't want to blow my own horn, but I've done the kind of a job that should have been done years ago in this country about this extremely important war. It's, a, it's part of the mainstream of our history. It's something people should know about. It's the making of the country. But what I'm trying to say in these books is that people are in control of their own destinies, that we are not uh, 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 run by fate. We are not the playthings of fate. Fate is made by men and women that we run our own lives. And uh, I think that these two books in the war uh, will show that. The Invasion of Canada is Burton's first book in two years, a drought by his standards. He's written everything from children's stories to cookbooks, but his biggest sellers are Canadian history. It's history made readable, popular, and profitable for him and his publisher, Jack McClellan. Tell me, how important is Pierre Burton to your firm? I'm told he really keeps McClellan Stewart afloat. I would say he's much more important to McClellan and Stewart than Jack McClellan is, yes. Uh, without Pierre Burton, we wouldn't be looking very strong. He's a major author. We have, you know, half a dozen major authors, but he's the big one. What do you tell Gordon Sinclair when he asks you, Pierre, how much money you made over the years out of all these books? I tell him it's none of his business. And he says, well, you're obviously a millionaire, Pierre. I tell You've him got I more money I tell than I have. I tell him I don't know because I haven't kept track. I, I know what my grosses are. I have no idea what my net is. Am I right? You'll pull at least a quarter of a million out of that latest book? 
Uh, let me think. Uh, 100,000 copies, if it what? sells that. I, I don't know. 100,000 copies? Uh, 100,000 copies at $3 a copy, of which a dollar goes to my researcher, was $200,000 for me, and 100,000 for my research assistant. I don't want to make you feel old, but I was home this summer, and I dug this out of the basement. Remember that? Yes, I remember very well. A very successful uh, book, at... The Golden Trail. Now, I must have been eight or ten years old. To little Eric, <laughs> in the hopes that someday he will become a famous interviewer. Gordon Sinclair, Betty Kennedy, Pierre Burton. However much Pierre Burton wants to be known for writing history, this is where he became famous. Tonight, meet the people whose stories have made headlines at home and all He's been a fixture on Canada's most popular game show for 25 years. As I tell uh, audiences each time we do the show, we learned long ago in radio that if you applaud rapidly, you'll sound like you're twice as many. Burton and Gordon Sinclair are not really pals. This is a business to them, and Burton makes sure it's profitable. He negotiates for the regulars on the show, and they each get more than $1,500 for each performance. One, two, three, go! I suppose you live on a farm in Clay and Burton. Yeah. Well, I was wondering why my face is so red. There's been no sun. Must be whiskey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sake, yeah. I drink a lot of sake. And here he is, Pierre Burton! This is Pierre Burton. This is Charles Templeton. And every morning on a national radio network, it's dialogue. These two men can wake up each day with an instant, unrehearsed opinion on just about any subject, even jogging. I would think it would be better, for instance, to do something else that exercises the whole body. Well, what do you do, Charles? Not much. <laughs> now we've got... Actually, now we're down to the bottom line, What boy. I do, Pierre, as a matter of fact, what I... Tell me what you do. All right, what I do, is, what that I do is I walk. What I do is walk. Pierre, if you walk, Pushing the world Charles, with your stride, you're fine. I'd, I'd, I'd set your, I'd you're set, hooked. I'd, you're set hooked. Your, I'd set your business in order if I were you. <laughs> and now, the Pierre Burton Show. It ran for 11 years, and it was all Pierre. He waded into every subject imaginable. Nothing was sacred. What was Jesus Christ really like? Was he gentle, meek, and mild, as the old hymn has it? He was nothing of the sort. Was he the Prince of Peace? Not if you believe his own words. And was he as fond of his mother as popular tradition suggests? His own mother might not have approved of that. Pierre and his sister Lucy interviewed her on one of the early shows. But I remember you telling me about the time at the age of two I was in the hospital in Dawson with pneumonia and almost died. Yes. Mm, you were ill. And there was a prostitute who offered yes. an orange and you wouldn't yes. accept it. Oh, I accepted it, but I wouldn't go in and thank her. You, you were crying for orange, ah do, ah do, ah do. That was orange, the juice. orange juice, and we couldn't. There wasn't an orange in town, and this old woman next door, who was a prostitute, had heard that uh, heard you crying, and she sent in an orange, and you went had an orange. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness' sake. It was a low-budget production, and even the Burton daughters were expected to contribute. But even on this, Dad had an opinion. I don't uh, think too much of that song. You're separating the good children from the bad. Uh, what's that phrase in there? You better not pouch, you better not cry. That really tells you to bottle up your tears, which children shouldn't do. The children should be allowed to cry sometimes. Nor should we separate at Christmas time children into two groups, the naughty and the nice, the bad guys and the good guys. Fred, just to the left of the, there's a, a little stump sticking up in the foreground, way over to the right there. If you want to catch Burton with his guard down, for once just a little uncertain, you have to watch him in his off hours. Yeah. You got him in the scope? What do you think? Locus Gull is a life bird for me. Those birds are colder than I am. Whoopee! He likes to go bird watching, and sometimes he and his daughter Pamela aren't sure exactly what they're seeing. 
His wife Janet gets up with him at 5.30 in the morning so they can stand all day in the cold drizzle counting birds. Bright yellow breast, streaks all the way down the breast, a yellow collar. It's a very handsome bird. They're at the post. There they go. Burton is basically a shy man who doesn't find his close friends among the show business crowd in Toronto. They're here in places like the Vancouver Racetrack, and they include people like Harry Fillion, a crony from Burton's newspaper days who is now the public relations man at the track. I would think a lot of people would identify you with the people that they see you with on television That's and hear you with on the radio. Are those your close friends? No, not really. I don't think... Uh... I know Gordon Sinclair well, but I know him well through uh, professionally. I don't think Gordon's ever been in... Uh, maybe he's been in the house once. I've never been to his place. Betty I know better socially, but she's not a close friend. Uh, she's an intimate, I suppose, Fred Davis. The people I know well, the people I know best, are the people I, uh, I've spent my time at university with or in the Army with, and they're mostly out here in Vancouver, with some exceptions. Burton doesn't know much about horse racing, and he cares even less. He's at the track to spend the day with Phileon. I've been around the race a long time, and here the only man who's ever bet four horses to win in the same race. <laughs> if the four horse had won, I would have won. Then I could have bet the four horse. There's almost no way they could have won. Right. This wants money now. Just the cash. Such as it is. You're absolutely right. I paid. I bet twenty, and I get back nine. Yes. Oh. oh, aren't you, Pierre Burton? I've watched you. Well, I so say different years. things. Like uh, I say thank you very much. It's very kind of you. I mean, people are gracious enough to, uh, you know, to be nice to you. That's, after all, my business is being in the public eye, and I'm not going to uh, insult them unless they insult me occasionally. One guy came and said, "You're the." Call me something. He said, "You're the worst son of a bitch I've ever met." And I said, "Well, you're the." Sloppiest drunk Is I've ever met. Burton? But she was. Oh, no. <laughs> Why don't I look like him? Sorry? Don't I look like him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Burton. Hello, how are you? Very nice to see you. Nice to see you. Got any winners today? Not yet. Oh, I got one. <laughs> Hal Strait was Burton's editor at the Vancouver Sun the man who sent him after the big stories in the old days. The last one. Eight feet. Oh, it's bigger every way. Pretty slick. But for all the talk about roughing it, it's not their style today as they set out to catch salmon. Bite. Comes. Big bastard. Christ, look at the son of a bitch. Yeah. Another goddamn rock cod. No matter. Burton would rather eat them than catch them anyway. I think now the only place that we can tie down Pierre Burton is on his cooking and his famous recipes. Now, are you a good cook? No. Or as we understand, your wife is a good cook and you're just a good, a good eater. I'm, I love to eat. She's an excellent cook. My, all my children are better cooks than I am. Modesty about his cooking ability never stopped Burton from doing television shows about food and writing cookbooks. He likes it Canadian and insists that it never be overcooked. And I know that all Canadians don't overcook their food. Pierre says he married me because I like my steak rare. Well, that's not the only reason. She also likes her eggs boiled very soft, and she loves her lamb chops pink. Yeah, the suckling pig, that was a dandy, too. It had red cherries in its eyes. So Burton, this was delicious, and we were all there. And it was New Year's Eve, and we were all dressed up in dinner jackets. So he plunges the knife into the neck where you cut it down like that. And at this point, a blood tear came oozing out of this pig's <laughs> eye and ran out of his already red eye and it ran right down his cheek. It looked like he was weeping. There's certain things I make and make very well. I make a very good tomato soup. I make a very good corned beef hash. Ah, corned beef hash. I want to read you something here. Guess who wrote it? What better, I ask you, than a plate of this fragrant, sizzling hash to give you wide screen dreams in beautiful technicolor, starring long-tressed maidens, 
gossamer-clad, dancing wildly to moon-mad music. Corned beef hash really do that to you? Well, I think if you're going to sell corned beef hash to the readers, you have to give it a little music and a little violins. That's what I was doing. I'm a writer. <laughs> a few years ago, Burton packed his whole family into some rafts and took them down the Yukon River, home to Dawson City. Burton grew up in Klondike country, but he was no ordinary miner's kid. He had extraordinary parents. His father was a civil servant who read ancient Greek and did algebra problems for fun. His mother played Chopin on the family piano and wrote novels. But for all that civility at home, the wilderness had a profound effect on him, and he wanted to share that with his children, even though some of the memories were painful. I used to feel very sad. When I, when I first went back after a long period of years, I almost cried, because it did look shabby. But then it looked shabby, and I grew up in it, and I, wasn't, I was just seeing it again with the eyes of a stranger. Well, I think half of Dawson's charm is that part of it is falling down. For instance, the gun shop, which everybody sees, is charming because it's propped up. It's almost falling to pieces and not quite. It's what people take pictures of. The sense of decay there is part of our heritage. I'm, of course, especially fond of Dawson because I was raised there, but almost everybody who goes feels a certain magic about it. Do you still have any friends up there? Johnny Gould, we went to school together. Uh, he's worked for Parks Canada, and he runs a trailer camp in Dawson. I see him all the time. Well, I remember him as a, I don't know, a prim and proper type kid, you know. Uh, well, I would say a little Lord Fauntroy. He was always neatly dressed, and he wasn't, didn't seem to be a rowdy like a lot of the other kids. Burton's first books were about the Klondike, and like most Canadian history, he insists that the real story is better than any Hollywood version. He was so outraged by scenes like this that he wrote a book about how Hollywood has systematically distorted Canadian history. Gold. 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 Klondike Fever is the latest gold rush epic. Burton was paid $12,000 as a consultant, but when he saw what they were doing, he struck his name from the credits. He says he could have gone to work in the Hollywood gold mine years ago, but chose to stay in Canada and tell it like it was. I long ago decided that this was my country, that I was interested in living here, not in the States. I could have gone to the States and done well, I think, had some offers, and that I wanted to speak to my people, and that if they listened, I wouldn't care who if if anybody else listened. Are you the guy who's got absolutely everything? You've got a family you're proud of, you've got work that you like to do and you're good at, and you make lots of money doing it. Is there anything you haven't got? Grandchildren. <laughs> that's about all. And that you can't work at yourself? That I have no control over. I'd like to have them, though. Do you like being interviewed? Do you like talking about yourself? I thoroughly oh. enjoy it. Yeah. You like people doing profiles on yeah, you? Yeah, I enjoy it. I like, talking, I like talking about myself. I don't think there's any point in anybody who's a public figure pretending they don't like it, because that's just BS. Of course they like it. Why would they do it? You don't have to do it. There's all sorts of other things you can do. Some people say, you know, that know you much better than I know you, that you're basically quite a shy guy, and this sort of rude, blustery, opinionated personality is really one you've invented to, uh, to compensate for that. I think there's no doubt about it. I think that I'm not professionally shy because I can't afford to be. I'm a six foot three. I look down on most people from my height. Uh, uh, I'm big and slightly awkward. I don't wear clothes very well. I'm, I'm not dapper as small people are. And I think all this contributes to a kind of shyness. I'm the kid at school that always got beaten up because I was the biggest and everybody wanted to take a whack at me. And, and I really quite successfully. Is there anything new about Pierre Burton? in the last 10 years. How the hell should I know? You're Pierre Burton. Well, I know, but I, I'm not terribly respected. Yeah. Are you not? No, no. Day comes up, the sun comes up, you get up, that's right. the day. Do my work, enjoy myself. I think you, I don't think you should spend too much time staring at your navel. I don't think you should spend too much time worrying about yourself or your future. I think every, if you live every day as if it's your last day, 
then your last day is probably going to be pretty good one because one day is going to be your last. So I just take it as it comes.